Hi, sorry, I'm a little bit late. Um, and also, uh, I have to apologize in advance that uh, our cats are at the vet getting, actually it's just dental work, but they have to put them under anesthesia, so uh, the vet may call me with an update, in which case I will have, have to take the call. Uh, and my wife, by a strange coincidence, is at the human dentist, so she won't be able to get it. <laughs> um, all right. Um, with that out of the way, um, um, oh yeah, someone says that's fine. Hopefully things are all right. Yeah, I'm sure they're fine. It's just uh, they're having some teeth extracted, so... Um, okay, um, okay, so what is the function of the rest of the book, Structure of Scientific Revolutions? Um, and, uh, well, it is called the Structure of Scientific Revolutions, so it's not surprising that the rest of it is basically about revolutions, but, um, as I mentioned last time, uh, as far as as I see it, and I think as Kuhn saw it, and definitely as Popperians saw it when they responded, the description of normal science is really the heart of the argument of the book, and the most surprising thing. Um, and just uh, to remind you, so the way normal science works is, that you have a, a paradigm, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, leaving aside the various ambiguities of that term, basically, a paradigm is is a kind of framework, or it's an example that that suggests a framework um, within which we're doing our, our work, and it's. In some ways, it's like one of Popper's theories that we're testing. In some ways, it's like one of Carnap's languages that we're using. Um, it's a framework we've adopted, but uh, we can't justify our adoption of it. Um, at least not in the same way we can justify the things we can assert once we've accepted it. Um, so, um, and this framework uh, says what counts as an observation, uh, which observations are worth making, uh, what to expect as a result, um, and a host of other things. So the real difference from Popper, and this is the difference that actually allows in all those other components, basically, is the motive we have for adopting this framework without justification. Um, so according to Popper, when we work with one of his theories, we are indeed working with something that tells us in advance what to expect. That's right, that's, that's the point of it. But the reason we want something that tells us in advance what to expect is so we can test it, right? Like if it doesn't say one th way or the other what to expect, then it's not falsifiable and it's not a scientific theory, according to Popper. Um, so, um, um, and if, according to Popper, if we do that with it, right, if we take what it tells us to expect and use it to test it, let's see if that happens, what, if what we expect happens. I mean, I guess when I say it tells us what to expect, according to Popper, I mean, Popper and Kuhn also agree about this, I guess, it doesn't tell us, it doesn't rationally convince us that we should expect a certain thing. 
right? It doesn't give us a reason to expect something. But adopting it means, psychologically speaking, that we do expect something, right? And so, but, um, so, but again, according to Popper, um, what we should do with that, if we want to nevertheless be rational and therefore free beings, what we should do with something that unjustifiably makes us expect stuff is subject to severe tests. Go and see if those things that we expect actually happen. Um, so even though our adoption of the theory is unfree, um, I mean, you could almost say that, you know, Popper might agree that in some sense we're addicted to this theory, right? If, like, if you think about going around expecting things without having a reason to as a kind of um, addiction. <laughs> um, but so even though our 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 belief in the theory is irrational and unfree. Our total methodology is rational and free. All of that is popper, right? As opposed to that, a Kuhnian paradigm tells us what to do and what to expect. Um, so we won't raise the wrong questions. And we don't want to raise the wrong questions, and we don't want our students to raise the wrong questions because we don't want to test the paradigm. We're not interested in that. We want to see the things the paradigm expects us to see in the world. And why do we want that? So like, for example, you might imagine, oh, we want that because it will be useful. Um, now, again, I pointed out, Kuhn says sometimes, yeah, science in the long term is useful or is sometimes useful. He doesn't really explain why that is. Um, he treats technology as, in principle, a completely different activity from science. And if anything, you know, when he suggests a connection between them, he says uh, something like, well, changes in technology can help stimulate paradigm changes in science, right? As opposed to the other way around, that science helps us figure out how to improve technology. So, um, um, so anyway, like maybe doing this is useful, but Kuhn says uh, scientists, that's not why scientists want to do it anyway. Because, you know, if there are parts of what the paradigm tells us to expect that seem manifestly useful, right? Like calculating what time the sun will rise tomorrow if you're, you know, um, uh, you know putting de together tables of sunrise and sunset, and tide tables and, um, you know, tables of the strengths of materials and stuff like that. So, right, uh, Kuhn says... Scientists uh, are not interested in that and will outsource it to engineers. <laughs> um, so why do they want to do this? And the answer is because they're addicted to puzzle solving. Right? The, ch the challenge is to find the things that the theory tells you to expect in the world. Just like when you're building a jigsaw puzzle, the challenge is to make the picture that the that the that the box tells you to expect. <laughs> you look at the picture on the front of the box, you know what to expect, and the challenge is to get what you expect. Um, and even if the box doesn't have a picture, and a more general, and I guess scientific paradigms are supposed to be more like this, uh, even if you don't have an exact picture, you know in general what kind of solution to expect from a jigsaw puzzle. Right. I mean, you know what will be needed to do it and what things you should not have to do to solve it. You shouldn't have to force the pieces. You shouldn't have to turn them over. You know, with at least with most jigsaw puzzles, you know that it will be a rectangle. 
right? So you can find the corner pieces and so on and so forth, right? So that's what a paradigm is like. It tells you what to expect and it gives you the challenge, get to this. Um, And so, as against Popper and against Carnap, but as I keep suggesting, this it's hard to confront Kuhn directly with Carnap. They're not really exactly part of the same conversation. But as against Popper, who sees um, uh, the scientific method as, as kind of the locus of human freedom and responsibility and rationality. Um, Kuhn says, compared to other creative fields, science is closed, narrow, rigid, um, addictive, um, unfree, irrational. Um, and uh, as I as I suggested before, it's you know it's not clear therefore what his attitude towards this activity is. We know that he himself stopped doing it. Um, it's something I kind of hate to mention because well no that's something I kind of love to mention but i regard it as a temptation because i'm not sure that i can that that i can back this up in any way but um you know in line with these kind of remarks i've been making about political differences and their connection to philosophy of science so um there's a, a distinction i know it from a book by a guy called todd Gitlin. I don't know how widespread it is or whether he invented it, but between the East Coast versus West Coast movements in the 60s. And the way he puts it is that um, the West, the East Coast movement was political um, in a kind of uh, more standard sense. Uh, Whereas the West Coast movement, as he puts it, was expressive, right? So like, in other words, the, the difference between plotting a revolution uh, um, and, um, and having the summer of love or something like that, right? So, um, so you know, and the... One thing he quotes in connection with the West Coast movement is the, now, I mean, this is from after, this is from 1968. So, I mean, actually, I don't know when the slogan itself de uh, dates from, but uh, I guess at least became popular in Paris in May of 1968. The slogan is all power to the imagination. This was the slogan of the Situationist International Movement. <laughs> um, and so this is just a quote from a Wikipedia article on the Situationist International Movement, at least, you know, retrieved probably last time I taught this course, so I don't know if it still says this. Quote, the situationists possessed a strong anti-authoritarian current, commonly deriding the centralized bureaucracies of China and the Soviet Union in the same breath as capitalism. So, I mean, this kind of interestingly matches up with the difference between Putnam, who we know was very much one of these East Coast revolutionary types in the 60s that Gitlin is talking about, right? Again, he was, he was a Maoist, versus... Kuhn, now, I mean, again, as far as I know, outwardly, you know, I don't think Kuhn was a hippie or, you know, certainly not in 1962, but I don't think he ever was. Um, but he was in Berkeley in 1962. This is before Berkeley was Berkeley, but still, uh, you might think something was in the air. And... Um, uh, 
And when you think of those passages about how a child or a modern artist would take the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, throw off this whole rigid authoritarian bureaucratic structure and just use them to make a picture, that sounds very much like that West Coast um, situationist expressive 60s movement. All right, but like I said, uh, having put all that together, I, you know, I have to admit that it's kind of a um, tissue of unjustified uh, connections. <laughs> um, all right, so anyway, um, leaving that aside, um, right, so all of what I've been describing so far is normal science, according to Kuhn. Are there questions about this so far? There hasn't been a question for a long time, but then again, that's, well, no, maybe there was one last time. No, I don't know. Anyway, um, um, okay, but so all of this raises a problem, and this is the problem that Kuhn asks at the very beginning of chapter six, beginning of the reading for today. So if this is what science is like, why is it so good at making progress, both theoretical progress and observational progress, that is, new discoveries? Um, and the threat to Kuhn's view is um, that the answer you might think the answer was this. And I think, I mean, this is kind of in line with what Popper was saying when I read Popper's response to Kuhn last time. You might think that, yeah, like, unfortunately, you would say if you were Popper or you could imagine, maybe this is co closer to Lakatos actually in some ways, but you can imagine saying, no, it's not unfortunate. It's kind of useful actually. Normal science works this way until it falls into a crisis. So maybe you could agree with Kuhn, because Kuhn is going to argue that normal science is particularly good at finding anomalies. You know, so it's useful for that reason. But when, the, when you finally fixate on the anomaly and the crisis begins, then scientists wake up um, and... Uh, their routine is disrupted. They question all their fundamental assumptions. They regard their previous theory and the rest of the paradigm that goes with it as falsified. And that's when they do some real science. And the rest, what you're calling normal science, even if it happens most of the time, is not actually normal science because it's less than fully science, right? So in other words, you might think that all this argues for is that um, Popperian science only happens in a period of crisis, but that that's really where all the action is going on. By the way, I just, just in connection with what I, what I was saying before, you can see that, you know, there was more than one kind of like generalized anti-authoritarian current starting in the 60s, right? Like current kind of libertarian is an extreme form of it, but you know, liberal democratic thought uh, was also starting in the 60s in response to the same perceived bureaucratization and you know, centralization both of capitalist and communist economies, or socialist economies, I guess, strictly speaking. Um, and uh, Popper is kind of lined up with that kind of anti-authoritarianism. So, you know, and that's why I pointed out last time that he, blame, he blames normal science on militarization, right, on the modern armaments race. <laughs> um, that's a little, like, the modern armaments race is a good example of a kind of huge centralized bureaucratized enterprise that happens equally under capitalism and under socialism. That's the whole point of it. It's a 
arms race between the two, right? And Popper is getting in a little anti-authoritarian jab against that. Um, in any case, sorry for that. I mean, are these degree? These are not really digressions. These, I mean, I'm trying all along to, as I think I've said all along, to you know remind people what the stakes are in these issues. That we're not just talking about technical, logical questions here. The, the, the nature and the rationality or irrationality of modern science and whatever, these are like central political issues and they're connected to all other political issues. Um, anyway, however, getting back to the more detail here. Um, so, so that's the threat to Kuhn. The threat to Kuhn is that people are going to say, oh yeah, normal science. Yeah, well, that's not really science. You're right. That's just kind of the stupid unconscious routine um, but here when there's a revolution that's when the scientists get going and Popper will say and look all my prime examples like Newton and Einstein or you know those are all examples of revolutionary scientists so Kuhn this is why Kuhn has to pay so much attention to explaining the structure of scientific revolutions he needs to explain that what really happens in a scientific revolution to show that it's not some kind of exception. And um, so in effect, what happens in the latter part of the book is parallel to what is a kind of paradigm articulation, as Kuhn puts that in connection with uh, scientific paradigms, or, a, or as he also calls it, a kind of mopping up operation. <laughs> um, he's, uh, his new paradigm, which is the paradigm of normal science, as opposed to the Popperian paradigm of science, his, so his new paradigm is, um, he has to do some work to bring it into touch with reality also in these revolutionary periods and that's what he's doing um, and you know in today's reading this is some of, these are some of the places where Kuhn actually hints most explicitly that he considers what he's doing to be an example of paradigm change of the same kind he's describing um, so I'll say more about that later but um, in any case, so here's how the explanation goes. There are um, actually two steps in here, or possibly three. I'm not sure exactly how to count them. Let me erase puzzle solving because that will be probably confusing. So, um, so the first time, the first stage is what Kuhn calls extraordinary science. And um, extraordinary science uh, might not actually lead to a revolution. That's why it's clearly a separate stage. Extraordinary science might not actually lead to a revolution. Sometimes, so extraordinary science involves a crisis, but sometimes the crisis can be resolved um, either by actually solving the difficult puzzle that set it off, under the old rules, and then everything can go back to normal. Or by just setting the really hard problem aside as a topic for future research. And then everything can go back to normal. Now, Kuhn doesn't give any examples of either of these, but, uh, but he says that these are both possibilities and they sometimes happen. Um, whereas the second stage is the revolution, strictly speaking. also known 
and this is probably Kuhn's most famous phrase. If his term, if his most favorite ter famous term is paradigm, this is his most famous phrase, paradigm shift, <laughs> right? The revolution is where the paradigm changes. Um, and so, although this is an extended period, this, he says, even though there's a lot of mopping up to do afterwards, um, the key thing happens sometimes like in an instant. Oops, that's the vet. <laughs> I warned you. Okay, hold on a second. Hello? Yes, and but we can't talk long because I'm teaching a, a class via Zoom now. But um, uh, she's she's at the human dentist. So <laughs> oh my. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh my. Okay. 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 All right. Okay, thank you. All right, bye. Oh my, poor kitty. She has to have one of her upper canines taken out. Anyway, um, uh, right, so uh, Kuhn says that this, this stage, you know, is something that, eventually happens in a single person, of course he says a single man, but a single person's mind in the middle of the night, you know, um, it's, it just dawns on them, new paradigm. Um, now I said I'm not sure if there's two stages or three, and the reason I'm not sure is because I'm not sure if this should be split into two. Um, I, I sometimes it sounds like this has two distinct phases, the extraordinary science. And the first one is um, um, where the, I mean, it's, it, it starts when a certain anomaly, that is something that's not going the way the paradigm tells us to expect, um, catches everyone's attention. And he says it's like not easy to say when that, why or when that happens, because there's always lots of anomalies. There have to always be lots of anomalies, because without anomalies, there wouldn't be puzzle solving. And without puzzle solving, there wouldn't be normal science. Right? So there always have to be all kinds of little difficulties where things aren't um, doing what we expect, because that's where we do our work, to, to make the matchup happen. Right? But at some point, and that's when the extraordinary science takes off, one of those anomalies starts to seem really urgent. And the first phase, if these really are two phases, um, um, is that the whole field starts to fixate on this one problem. But so far, they're still treating it as a normal puzzle to be solved in the normal way. So the old paradigm is still firmly in control. And then the second phase, and again, I think this is a separate phase, or at least if this whole thing lasts long enough, then it would be a separate phase, um, is when um, people start to disagree about what the old paradigm meant, people start to do uh, random, ad hoc theoretical adjustments and also start conducting random experiments just to see what will happen. Um, 
Um, so anyway, so those would be the two parts of this. Those are both of those are extraordinary, but the second one is more extraordinary. Uh, again, like I'm not sure. Maybe I'm not sure how to arrange these things. Maybe the first one is really just a part of normal science, and uh, his, his terminology, as often, is not a hundred percent clearly fixed. Um, okay, so those are the two phases or three phases. And what Kuhn wants to show is that even in these phases, science is not Popperian. So his claim is, um, first of all, that science always produces fundamental observational or theoretical novelties inadvertently. Scientists were, are, were never trying to get them. Number two, that the way science responds to them when it can't make them go away is by looking for a new system of puzzle solving under which this anomaly is an expected solution. So someone said, I thought it was three. Okay, there's a vote for three. <laughs> anyway, um, right, so, um, 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 It does that only if it can't hold on to the old paradigm. And on the other hand, it holds on to the old paradigm and can, until it can do that. So there's never a phase where people are just testing paradigms to see which one is better. They're holding on to the old one because it's the only way they can do their work that they're addicted to until someone manages to come up with a new set of puzzle solving rules under which um, there's a solution to the problem that everyone's, the puzzle that everyone's fixated on. And I mean, it has to also promise lots more puzzles for people to work on. And then pretty quickly, it might take a generation sometimes, pretty quickly, everyone switches to those rules. Um, and then, lastly, um, science quickly represses all memory of the old rules. Because to function as puzzle solving rules, the new ones have to uh, be accepted without question the way the old ones were. Um, right, so here is Kuhn's um, summary of this. This is on page. Oh, no, wait. I didn't want to do screen share. I wanted to switch to. That is what fundamental novelties of fact and theory do. Produced inadvertently by game played under one set of rules, their assimilation requires the elaboration of another set. Assimilation means, again, in this context, means making them no longer puzzling. In fact, he says that um, the under the new paradigm, what used to be an astonishing anomaly often ends up to being um, sounding tautologous. Right? That is sounding like the to deny it would be a contradiction in terms. Um, Okay, so um, are there questions about that? 
general overview so far. All right, so um, I'll leave that there. So the challenge in the extraordinary science phase um, is to show that um, what happens during that phase is not that a theory is falsified by a counter instance. Right? I mean, that in a sense is exactly why there are these, these are different phases. The theory uh, in this phase, the theory or properly speaking, the paradigm um, remains the paradigm. Um, the anomaly doesn't lead people to conclude that it's false. Um, right, and here is where the, the point comes in. This was one of the things that Putnam quoted from Kuhn, I believe, that only in the presence of a new theory or, strictly speaking, a new paradigm um, is the old one ever get regarded as falsified. Putnam actually said, well, you know, there may be some exceptions to that if things really went haywire, you know, but, uh, but that's Putnam's uh, trying to make Kuhn more moderate, or maybe in view of what I said before, not necessarily more moderate, but more politically useful. <laughs> Um, so, um, but in any case, uh, Kuhn says, yeah, only in the presence of a new paradigm will the old one ever be um, regarded as falsified. Um, now, um, it, now I'm going to say something, I'm going to go into a discussion that's a little bit confusing because I'm going to discuss... Um, the main place where Kuhn starts talking about himself using his own theory, so um, or using his own paradigm, I guess you should say. Um, so it's it's confusing because there's going to be you know Kuhn who's talking and Kuhn who's who's being talked about, sort of mixing with each other. Um, so uh, so what Kuhn says about this, and perhaps unlike Putnam, Kuhn knows that he's not the first one to have noticed that we don't just lay aside theories when they're quote unquote falsified. He knows that this has already been noticed and he probably knows even that it's already been noticed by Popper himself. As again, Putnam seems maybe not to. <laughs> um, so, um, so Kuhn says, you know, the, the fact that scientists in these, this phase, when there's no new paradigm, don't say, oh, the old theory is falsified, um, is not a refutation or counter instance to the old and read Popperian way of thinking about the history of science. Um, um, Right, if you compare this to Lakatos's response to Popper, Lakatos is trying in some way to, to use Popper's methodology to describe Popper, right? And so Lakatos takes it that there should be an answer to what would lead you to say that your view about science has been falsified, refuted, that we have to reject it. What observations, so to speak, and and you know, Lakatos says, well, if the uh, the uh, basic normative sentences 
accepted by the scientific community contradicted your methodology or something like that. So, um, but, uh, but Kuhn says, in line with his own view, no, of course, uh, this can't force Popper to give up his view. From Popper's point of view, it's uh, an anomaly. It's a puzzle. Right, so let me read what he says about this on page 78. beginning of this sentence is, uh, you know, these examples are not themselves counter instances to a prevalent epistemological theory. As such, if my present point is correct, so now, I mean, this is explicit. He means if my present point about the way things happen in scientific revolutions is correct, implicit premise, and of course epistemological revolutions are just like scientific revolutions, right? So as such, if my present point is correct, they can at best help to create a, a crisis or more accurately to reinforce one that is already very much in existence. By themselves, they cannot and will not falsify that philosophical theory. For its defenders will do what we have already seen scientists doing when confronted by anomaly. They will devise numerous articulations and ad hoc modifications of their theory in order to eliminate any apparent conflict. Right? So the, the prediction, at least, is that um, when, and I mean, I guess he thinks, actually, he says in the continuation of this passage that he thinks that this is already happening in the epistemological literature, I guess what we would call in the philosophy of science literature. Um, this is already happening. Um, I guess actually they already would have called it the philosophy of science literature in 1962. That's an interesting question. I think they, I think they did. Um, well, in any case, so um, he thinks this is, he, you already see this happening and what's happening is yes, people have noticed this thing. It was noticed actually right away by Popper himself, that's not a problem for Kuhn, right? Kuhn says, of course, a paradigm always has anomalies and accepted solutions or tentative solutions to anomalies and ones that require further work and so forth, right? So, um, so this is some, an anomaly that was noticed right away and, but it, but it's, been resisting solution, and uh, but what we can expect is we can expect the philosophers who are now acting like normal scientists in crisis, according to Kuhn. What we can expect the philosophers to do is to do what extraordinary scientists do, you know, um, try out all kinds of kind of random ad hoc articulations of their philosophy of science theory to assimilate this anomalous fact. And again, the anomalous fact is, and I'm sorry this is confusing, but it's also what's so interesting here. The anomalous fact is the fact that scientists act the way, according to Kuhn, the philosophers themselves are acting as this goes on, right? So the anomalous fact is that scientists faced with a crisis don't give up their theory, but just start these ad hoc articulations. Um, that's, the, that's the anomaly that the philosophers of science are trying to deal with. And Kuhn says, and in fact, the philosophers of science are not only facing that anomaly, but they're examples of it themselves, because they're acting the same way the scientists would act in the face of an anomaly. Um, And so his prediction obviously is that this crisis will last until there's a new paradigm. And uh, um, sometimes he sounds kind of modest, but most of the time the implication seems to be, and the new paradigm is my new paradigm that I'm telling you in this book, right? I'm that man who 
had that idea dawn on him. Um, right, as a matter of fact, if you look on page 90, Almost always the men who achieve these fundamental inventions of a new paradigm have been either very young or very new to the field whose paradigm they change. Right? Remember, I told you, I mean, first of all, Kuhn was still, I don't know, I don't remember exactly when he was born, but he still was pretty young in 1962. But more importantly, he was an outsider to philosophy when he started working out these ideas. He came from physics to philosophy. So I think when he says almost always these men are young and are outsiders in the field, um, he's thinking of himself. <laughs> right, so he's thinking of himself as fitting that pattern. Um, so here, I mean, of all places in the book, it seems like we have the clearest implication of an answer to the question I raised at the beginning last time, whether Kuhn thinks what he's, his own field is an example of the structure he's talking about. Um, and it seems like the answer is yes. Um, but as I also pointed out when I raised that question, uh, it's a problem that he thinks the answer is yes, because um, uh, who would say that philosophy of science is a mature science in crisis? It seems strange. It seems, I mean, look, one of the, um, points that I'm trying to make in the very structure of the syllabus here is that there were at least two competing schools in this period. <laughs> there wasn't a single commonly accepted paradigm. Um, so, uh, but I mean, beyond that, there's many reasons to think that philosophers then and now don't act very much like uh, Kuhn's normal scientists. Um, you know, uh, he could, of course, although even this is strange because remember, there seem, when he talks about this, there seems to be a certain order to the way fields become mature. And a lot of people have this order. And I, I think it's an order of something, as I said before, whether it's an order of maturity so that, you know, if you wait long enough, every field will be like physics. I doubt very much, actually, but uh, that's a common view of what this is an order of, and the order, whatever it's an order of, is, uh, is usually the same, right? So there's like physics, chemistry, biology, psychology, social science, and then at the end, <laughs> you might get philosophy. So it seems strange that philosophy would all, all of a sudden be run, pulling ahead of the pack, according to Kuhn. Um, if, you know, if that was, if that is his intention here, then, uh, I, I believe he, he failed to predict what was going to happen because, um, uh, I mean, and this is already also contained maybe in the things I first said about Kuhn, about how he's been received. I think philosophy has neither, um, solved his puzzle such to, as to make it go away and return to some old paradigm, nor has philosophy set it aside for future work. Um, people still think about it. Um, nor has philosophy switched to Kuhn's new paradigm. So if this was supposed to be a philosophical revolution, it doesn't seem to have played out the way Kuhn says scientific revolutions do. Um, okay, so anyway, Kuhn says, um, but I guess I should stop again and ask if there are questions, especially because I did just say something 
kind of complicated. I keep warning about this, but I still, I know from experience, this is a hard kind of thought for people to think. So if you have a question about it, please ask me. Um, it's, it's a hard kind of thought for most people to think, and it's one of my favorite kinds of thoughts. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, right, so, so Kuhn's claim is that, you know, returning a little bit to a lower level, Kuhn's claim is that, you know, although the way scientists act in this period is not a refutation of Popper, it's an anomaly for Popper because what, you know, naive falsification, falsificationism would lead you to expect is that the, when scientists found an anomaly they couldn't solve, they would be like, okay, theory is false. Let's try a new one. Um, anyone have a new one? But they don't react that way. They keep acting as if the old theory must be true and trying to adjust it. At first in a kind of normal way, but then in a kind of groping, like flailing way. But they're still, it's still, they're trying to adjust the old theory and the old way of doing things in general, the old paradigm, so that it can digest this anomaly in addition to all the others that it succeeded with over the years. Um, so, uh, but one sign that Kuhn's, um, um, I'm just looking at it to see if I'm not scheduled yet. Maybe I should actually mention this later. Well, I'll mention it now. Who knows? Later will come. So, so I mean, one sign that Kuhn's paradigm is like uh, one of one of the so the reason I thought maybe I should leave it later. Okay, now I'm talking more about this, right? Like, how are things going to change once the new paradigm is in place? And the the reason Kuhn's new paradigm is like the scientific paradigm, again, is because Kuhn says that the new paradigm will often take the thing that was puzzling and make it into a, log a kind of logical truth, right? So he discusses two examples of this, both on section, on page 78, um, the law of inertia. I think I've mentioned this before, Newton's second law. Um, the body in motion remains in motion against until unless acted upon by an outside force, right? Which you can read, right? Something like change in momentum with respect to time equals force. So for the what Kuhn thinks of the old paradigm here, late medieval dynamics, the impulse theory. Um, the puzzle was all about how to explain why things that are violently moved continue moving after the violent mover is, re is removed. Sorry, that's kind of a tongue twister. But the point, so according to Aristotle, there's two kinds of motion, natural motion and violent motion. Natural motion is... For example, so this pen, the element that predominates in it of the four elements is earth. And earth's natural place is in the center of the world. Um, so uh, this place's natural motion is towards the center. Sorry, this pen's natural motion is towards the center. If I let go of it, it will move towards the center. There it goes right? So fortunately I have another one. <laughs> um, so, uh, but on the other hand, the pen can also move up or left and right. So Aristotle says it only does that violently when it's forced to. So, um, right? So, you know, I mean, exactly how to explain how that's possible, never mind. But, I mean, because that gets into all kinds of questions about how living things do stuff 
And so the action of the moon on the outside of the sphere of fire and whatever. But in any case, uh, whatever the reason, sometimes something will grab the pen and force it to move in a different direction than its natural direction. Um, but the question for Aristotelian dynamics is, okay, but what happens when I throw the pen? Why does it keep moving? So while I was holding it, you understand it's moving violently because my hand is forcing it to move, but now I'm not touching it anymore. Why doesn't it fall straight towards the center? And um, this was a difficult question for Aristotelian dynamics. Originally, Aristotelians, including Aristotle himself, tried answers in terms of like somehow the air that's displaced is getting behind it and moving it along or something, but um, they couldn't really get that to work properly. And in the late in Middle Ages, people discussed, started discussing this thing called impulse, where when I, as I'm forcing the thing, I also impart to it a certain impulse, which it keeps after I let go of it for a while, and so it keeps going. Um, but that also didn't work out that well. And anyway, part of Newton's new paradigm was to turn that whole question around. And now if you say nothing's forcing it, why does it keep moving? The measure of whether something is forcing something in Newtonian dynamics is whether its momentum is changing. And that's what Kuhn means by saying it seems like a tautology or like a logical truth to say that if it's not being forced, its momentum doesn't change. It can't be falsified. I've discussed this example before, but you know, so I'm discussing it again. It can't be falsified because, you know, uh, Suppose I want to find an exception to the rule that if something is not being forced by anything, it, its momentum doesn't change. Well, um, how can I tell if it's not being forced by anything? Right? You can't see force. You measure force by measuring changes in momentum. So, um, Right, so I hope you understand now why Kuhn is saying this starts to look like a logical truth. The very thing that was such a big puzzle for the old paradigm now not only looks like a solved puzzle, but doesn't it, in some sense doesn't that look like a question you could even ask. <laughs> it's become right, like, why does the thing not change its momentum when it's not being forced? A thing that isn't changing momentum is the same as a thing that's not being forced. You're just, it's a tautology. You're saying the same thing twice. Um, right. So, um, and Kuhn's claim is, this is why I didn't put this off for later and decide to discuss it now. Kuhn's claim is that his new paradigm is going to do the same thing for this anomaly that scientists don't regard their theory as falsified until they have a new one. And the reason is that, as Kuhn puts it, if they did that, they would stop being scientists. <laughs> Right, so again, like it, it seems in the new, what seemed like a huge puzzle, or at least something of a puzzle in the old paradigm. Okay, scientists are trying to test their theories, so why don't they give up their theories when they find a falsifying instance? Isn't that what they wanted to do? Um, in Kuhn's paradigm, um, this turns out to be uh, the question is. Why don't scientists do something other than science? Because what is science? Science is puzzle solving <laughs> using an unquestioned paradigm. 
using the paradigm as a guide to what boxes everything has to be stuffed into, and you get your congratulations. As, as, as Kuhn puts it, this is when he's discussing the discovery of new chemical elements um, during a certain phase of chemistry, um, uh, that, you know, it's an occasion for congratulations, not for surprise, <laughs> right? Like, once you, these are the boxes you have to stuff it into. Paradigm tells you that. When you succeed in stuffing it in, everyone's like, yay, you solved that puzzle. But no one's like, wow, you stuffed it into that? Because of course you stuffed it into that, right? So, but according to Kuhn, that's what science is. That's what makes science different from other creative fields, those rigid paradigms, those boxes, whatever. And so um, um, if you ask, why don't scientists do something else? That's like asking, why don't scientists not be scientists? Or to put it the other way around, when you say scientists don't give up their old paradigm unless they have a new one waiting, you're just saying, scientists don't stop being scientists and keep being scientists. It's tautologous. You're saying scientists are scientists. <laughs> according, that is, I mean, put it this way, according to Kuhn's solution to the demarcation problem, what is the difference between science in the strict sense, modern science, the kind that makes these great discoveries and advances and so forth. The, the solution is modern science is a creative activity that has a paradigm. So when you say scientists don't give up their paradigm unless they have a new paradigm, you're saying scientists are scientists. In fact, Kuhn says, and this brings back the question of what Kuhn thinks you should do, like what Kuhn would recommend, Kuhn says sometimes, um, he says, probably we don't know who these men were. <laughs> um, their names haven't gone down in history. But uh, he gives an example of Wolfgang Pauli, very, who went on to be a very, very famous uh, theorist of quantum mechanics at the height of the crisis that resulted in quantum mechanics, saying what he imagines a lot of these people might have said to themselves, boy, I don't feel like being a scientist anymore at this point. I think, I wish I had been a movie comedian, I think is, the, is, the, is what Pauli says. Um, so, uh, right, and Kuhn is suggesting that, yeah, probably these crises did result in some scientists no longer playing the game, saying this is no fun. But those people, we don't count as scientists. They're not scientists. They're whatever they did afterwards, movie comedians or philosophers or whatever, they were outside the demarcation line. Um, Um. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to, well, Maybe if I recover all of this, right? Um, well, no, maybe it's worth going over this a little bit. Um, I mean, it's kind of the same thing I was just saying, but I'm going to say it in a different way. So, um, about what actually happens in this phase of extraordinary science. So again, what happens is not that scientists regard the old paradigm as falsifying. And certainly not that they wake up and realize, hey, we've been mindlessly following a routine and we don't want to do that anymore. 
Again, maybe some of them do, but those are the ones who don't continue being scientists. So rather than this being a period when people are waking up, this is a period when people are trying to fall back asleep or stay asleep in the face of um, some repressed feature of the real world, which is kind of poking through into their consciousness, catching their attention, distressing them. It's not making them, it can't make them unless it makes them stop being scientists. That is, unless it makes them wake up from science, lose their addiction, right? It can't uh, make them think that the old paradigm was unjustified or false or anything like that but it does distress them. Um, and in response, they start doing all kinds of stuff to try to push it back under the rug so they can go back to sleep, so they can go back to their addiction. Um, and I'm putting it that way partly because um, um, I feel like there's some parallel between what Kuhn thinks and what Freud thinks in this area, right? Freud's theory of dreams, which as far as I know is false, but uh, Freud's theory of dreams is that a dream is when uh, you're sleeping and something so disturbing is going on in your subconscious that it threatens to wake you up. <laughs> and to in order to keep that down and stay asleep, <laughs> your brain invents this symbolism to disguise the disturbing thing. That's, he, that's Freud's theory of what a dream is, and that's basically Kuhn's theory of what extraordinary science is. Whether he was thinking of Freud or not, I don't know, but he could have been. He does, he does mention Freud sometimes. Um, so, um, well, and also, I know that my teacher, Stanley Cavell, and Kuhn were very close to each other in the period when Kuhn was working on this book in Berkeley. Um, they each acknowledged the other in the prefaces to their first important books. Um, and uh, Cavell was always very much interested in Freud. So, um, so that's another reason it wouldn't be surprising if, if Kuhn is thinking about this. As I say, as you know, as a theory of what happens in the brain when we dream, I I think you know it's um, I think I think based on what we now know about how dreams happen, when they happen, etc., that this theory is probably not correct. But like a lot of things in Freud, whether it's correct or not as a scientific theory, it's philosophically suggestive. <laughs> um, so we sometimes end up, even if you don't, if you can't swallow psychoanalysis as science, you, you end up reaching for it again as some kind of symbol. Um, okay, so in any case, that's the overall view of what's going on in this period. How does it happen at all? How does it even start? Um, again, there are... Um, always anomalies as, as there are always quote unquote counter instances as normal science goes on. But the counter instances, like for example, the anomalous orbit of Neptune, I mean of Uranus, which was explained by the discovery of Neptune, um, are uh, um, not treated as counter instances. You know, Popper, and maybe even Putnam. No, I guess not Putnam. I guess Putnam is really following Kuhn somewhat when he said what he says about this. But Popper, you know, would say something like, "Well, you know, it is a counter instance, but we're not abandoning the theory yet because blah blah blah." But Kuhn says um, it's not treated as a counter instance at all. It's treated as a challenge to scientists to solve it. So, you know, if they can't solve it, it doesn't reflect badly on Newton's theory. It reflects badly on the scientists who can't explain 
the motion of Uranus using Newton's theory. Um, um, so uh, that kind of thing is constantly happening during normal science. And again, if it weren't happening, there would be no normal science. There would be nothing interesting about it. Um, so, um, so again, something has to happen, and Kuhn says it can be a number of things. Uh, maybe some of it is outside influence. People are asking the scientists, please, we need you to solve this problem in particular. Um, or uh, maybe it can be, you know, that for some reason, the scientists expect the solution to this puzzle to be particularly revealing, or, or maybe it's just it goes on for a long time. But um, for one reason or another, um, uh, this anomaly suddenly um, becomes uh, unignorable. It's not just a puzzle you could solve. It seems like a puzzle that must be solved if we're going to keep on going with these rules at all. Um, and um, Kuhn's point, remember I asked at the beginning, so why does science allow for progress in this especially um, radical way? Kuhn's point is, that that kind of distressing, unignorable anomaly is something that you need the paradigm to get, right? There must be some unquestioned thing that's telling you what to expect, what kind of explanations of natural events to expect, what kind of puzzles are supposed to have what kind of solution before you can get this kind of distressing anomaly. And it's um, interesting to compare this to, so Kuhn, this is on page 62 through 64. I'm not going to read it, but I'll just describe it, right? Kuhn mentions this psychological experiment where they showed people cards that um, some of them, some people saw normal cards. Each, each subject only sees one card, right? But some of them saw normal cards and others of them saw cards where the color and the, and the suit didn't match. So it would be like a, you know, black four of hearts or something like that. So, um, um, and people, like, when you showed it to them for a short period of time, they would without hesitation identify it as a normal card. Right? They would say, oh, yeah, that's a four of hearts. Or that's a four of spades. <laughs> but they wouldn't notice anything wrong about it. But then, as you showed it to them longer and longer, they would start saying something like, it's a four of hearts, but there's something weird about it. It's, you might even mention something that's not true, but it has a red border around it, or, you know, something like that. Um, and then, if you showed it to them longer and longer, they would start to get increasingly distressed, like, I don't know what I'm looking at. What is that? And then at some point, with a long enough exposure, most subjects would say, in an instant, it would dawn on them, oh, I see what it is. It's a four of hearts, but it's black. Then Kuhn mentions there's some people, these are like the cranks, right? There's some people who are never able to see the black four of hearts, no matter how long you show it to them. And they just get more and more distressed. <laughs> Um, but so in any case, like that whole experiment, which is supposed to be analogous to the phenomenon of paradigm change, the phenomenon of extraordinary science and paradigm change, as Kuhn describes them, um, that whole experiment could not be carried out with like rocks or seashells or something like that. Right? There isn't something that's analogous to a black I mean, maybe if you were an expert on seashells, I could do it to you or something. But like, um, but for most of us, anyway, there isn't anything that's analogous to a black four of hearts in a seashell. They just come in all different shapes and colors, you know. 
Um, so if you see some, you know, for a short length of time or a longer length of time, you just have to try to figure out what shape and color it is. But with cards, you have these rigid boxes that they have to fit into. And because you have these rigid boxes that they have to fit into, if they don't fit, it becomes increasingly distressing and obvious that something is happening. And it's in the face of that that you can be forced to suddenly change your whole way of looking at things. Um, So, um, Kuhn says, uh, for this reason, and I think this is another way of producing a kind of anomaly. This one is more for history of science than for philosophy of science. For this reason, when you look um, at discoveries, like the discovery of oxygen, um, so a discovery, right, we have, um, observational versus theoretical advances in science. When he talks about discoveries, and this is something he already discussed in chapter five, but he comes back to it and says more about it here. When we talk about discoveries, we're talking about something like the discovery of oxygen. So when you talk about discoveries, Kuhn says it's difficult. It always turns out the more you look into it to be harder and harder to say who made the discovery, who discovered oxygen. And the reason is because in this case, the whole field of science, so to speak, is similar to that person who's seeing that anomalous card. And at first they look at it, but they don't see it at all. <laughs> and then after a while, they still don't see the new card that's going to be discovered, right? The black four of hearts or whatever. But they do see that something's wrong and it distresses them. And then at the end of the process, when the paradigm changes and the types of things that are possible to be seen suddenly shift, they see it. Now, so the question is, but, but most of the time, but, but often it's not the same person who, right? It's the whole scientific community that's doing this. Oftentimes it's not the same person who first notices something amiss as the person who finally makes the shift and sees it. And so, um, right, like in the, and even if it is the same person, it's not at the same time. So if you can say who discovered it, you can't say when they discovered it exactly, right? So he says, you know, when, when Lavoisier started his, uh, I mean, he, it's more complicated because he mentions Priestley and some other people as well. But when Lavoisier started his experiments on oxygen, he had isolated something in, uh, you know, in, in, in a flask or whatever that, uh, but, uh, that he called the air itself entire. That is, he thought he had a particularly pure sample of air. Remember, air is one of the four ancient elements, right? So, um, you know, air is air, right? Uh, so he thought he had a, a particularly pure sample of air. And if that had turned out to be right, if the anomaly, if the, if the puzzle solving had succeeded and the old paradigm continued, then we would have said that Lavoisier at that point wasn't seeing some, anything that people hadn't seen lots of times before. You know, I mean, uh, his air was 
purer than other people's air, but everyone had always seen pure, more or less pure samples of air. <laughs> um, so we hadn't discovered anything. But by the end of the process, when everything shifted and he and Lavoisier was able to say, here I have a flask of oxygen, by that time it wasn't news anymore, basically. Like he had already been producing oxygen and doing stuff with it. Um, so uh, when in there did he discover it? And the answer is, it's hard to say. It depends which part of this process you call the discovery. He had already seen oxygen a long time ago and had a relatively pure sample of it and even, in a sense, knew some of its properties, but he doesn't, didn't know it was oxygen until he had already carried out all these experiments on it and so it was certainly already discovered. <laughs> um, okay, so, I mean, that's the observational case. Um, The theoretical case, and Kuhn says when he comes back to oxygen in the chapter on uh, crises, and um, so he says, you know, discoveries like the discovery of X-rays, there is something like a crisis, but in the case of these theoretical changes, the crisis tends to be much more acute, longer lasting, fundamental, whatever. This is part of as I said, as the book goes on, it starts to sound like the theory is really the main part of the paradigm, the paradigm theory. And this other stuff that he adds on about instrumentation and whatever does, sometimes seems to fall away. Um, maybe it's just a matter of degree. Uh, although, as I said, in the 1969 postscript, he actually says, yeah, I mean, let me just focus on the theory. That's the important part of the paradigm. <laughs> um, so, um, but in any case, in these cases, it's pretty much the same kind of thing, only it's in some sense much more widespread or fundamental or something like that, because we're not just talking about the discovery of a new... Um, uh, let's say of a new box that has to be filled under the old paradigm, we're discovering a whole new set of boxes. And uh, Kuhn comes back to the, the discovery of oxygen when he discusses these theoretical crises, because at the same time Lavoisier discovered oxygen, he was discovering the combustion theory, um, uh, or the oxidation theory of combustion, I guess is the right way to put this. Um, right, that is, he was discovering that the old theory that was called the phlogiston theory, um, right, so phlogiston was supposed to be some kind of element that was um, bound up in combustible things and fire resulted when phlogiston started flowing out of them under the influence of heat. And the fire stopped when all the phlogiston was out. <laughs> um, so that was the theory. Um, uh, you know, I'm kind of laughing about it, but I think Kuhn and Popper and others are right to point out that there was nothing ridiculous about it per se, and it's not right, but, uh, or at least it's not right unless, Putnam used to tell this story, I don't think it was his own remark, that, that someone had said to him, you know, there is phlogiston, phlogiston is valence electrons. If you don't understand that, never mind. But in any case, right, so like something was supposed to be flowing out of things when they're burning. Um, and that, that, you know, phlogiston moving around was supposed to explain all kinds of other stuff. Um, and after Lavoisier's revolution, uh, there was no more phlogiston. And combustion was explained by something in the air, oxygen, under the influence of heat, 
going into the thing and combining with it. Um, so now it depends what you're burning, right? If you're burning wood, then the way that happens is the oxygen combines with carbon and a lot of that just comes off as carbon dioxide. So, I mean, that's one of the observations that makes the phlogiston theory seem reasonable. When you burn wood, stuff comes out of it and afterwards it weighs less. See, the phlogiston has left, <laughs> right? But, uh, but if you, as Kuhn discusses this, right, if you roast metals, you know, so the result is metal oxide and the oxygen just stays there, the piece of metal weighs more after you roasted it than before. So, um, so this is not just like discovering a new card, the black four of Cards. This is like discovering a whole new system of cards, basically, right? The whole deck has to be reshuffled, so to speak. Yeah, that's a terrible metaphor. All right. Anyway, um, uh, uh, right? A whole range of things that people thought, puzzles that people thought they had solved under the phlogiston theory now had to be resolved under the oxygen theory. And sure enough, something comes out of it that sounds like a tautology, namely oxidation is caused by combination with oxygen. <laughs> right? It's, that's just like, you know, scientists don't give up their paradigm um, because people who don't have a paradigm are not scientists. In other words, scientists are scientists, not other people, <laughs> right? So similarly, oxidation is caused by combination with oxygen, not by anything else. It seems like a logical truth after the revolution. Um, I'm actually, for once, I'm a little bit ahead of myself, but let's see if there's something else I want to say here. Yeah, okay, I should, because I should I should go back. So, um, so the theoretical change, so first of all, let me just finish discussing the theoretical change. And, you know, in uh, these chapters, six through eight, uh, Kuhn is, is pretty... Uh, explicit about matching up the description of theoretical change to the previous description of observational change, that is a description of discovery in chapter five, and, and bringing them all under his new paradigm, right, and under his new account of how fundamental novelty, novelties emerge in science. Um, they emerge because People weren't looking for them. They just wanted to go on peacefully puzzle solving. Um, but a puzzle that for some reason they really want to solve keeps resisting solution. Um, or there are proposed solutions, but they're found one after another not to really work or something like that. And, um, um, so for a while, their puzzle solving becomes increasingly disturbed and they're unhappy because they, they, they want to get back to puzzle solving. Um, they start trying various like slight variations, articulations on the old rules. Um, but they just, uh, the, the, you know, and sometimes it works and then, you know, they just go back to what they were doing before. Um, but sometimes eventually it, it just, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And then all of a sudden in the middle of the night, there's a gestalt switch. Right. A gestalt switch that we're going to, this is, we're going to talk about this more in the, talk about the rest of the book the gestalt switch is you know when you like the famous duck rabbit picture 
Um, where, you know, if you look at it, you can see the reduct, right? In case anyone's not familiar with this, when you see the duct, this is the beak, and this is the eye. It's facing that way. But then you could also see a rabbit. When you see it as a rabbit, these are the ears, and it's facing that way, right? And then, so you can see it as a duck, or you can switch and see it as a rabbit. You can't really see it as both at the same time. Um, it's not clear what you do to switch. It just kind of has to happen. Um, someone can help you by, by saying the kind of things that I just did. Look, that's the ear, you know. Uh, but sometimes people only ever see one, even with help, in these examples. So, um, right, so somehow in the middle of the night, with, so it's not because of accumulation of data or because of confirmation of a falsifying hypothesis. The data remain the same before and after. Someone just figures out how to see them differently all of a sudden. And then after that, it's mopping up operations, right? I mean, uh, you know, people, so, I mean, it, as Kuhn says, and we have to go back and try to figure out why this is true according to him. Kuhn says it's the only way that it, this gestalt switch is not like a scientific revolution, but this is super important if we're trying to explain the progress of science, is that there's a the gestalt switch you can switch back. Uh, right, you, if you first see the duck and then you then see the rabbit, you can switch back and see the duck again, usually. Um, but with the scientific revolution, you can't switch back. It's not reversible. It only The switch only goes one direction. Um, so, I mean, that feature of it is going to be crucial to Kuhn's being able to use this to explain what looks like progress in science. You can already see that it's going to explain what looks like progress, but it's not going to be clear that we should call it progress necessarily. But in any case, um, so, uh, but leaving aside that difference, it's supposed to be just like this. After the revolution, every, the, the person who originated sees things differently and then, you know, helps everyone else see them differently. And because of whatever that feature is that makes it not reversible, that makes you want to go in one direction and not the other, people, you know, like to go to the new paradigm. It's the one that's going to allow them to go back to puzzle solving, roughly speaking. So eventually most people do. And then the revolution is over. And once the revolution is over, the old boxes are no longer available. So when you tell the history of your field, you won't mention who discovered phlogiston, right? That won't be one of the landmarks in the history of chemistry. You just forget about phlogiston. There was no, uh, showing that the old theory is just a special case of the new one. The old theory is forgotten. And okay, now I really am out of time. So I'll just say um, that I think if you think through every phase of this project, of this process, you'll see that there's no point where people are acting freely and rationally in Kuhn's account. Right? They're always either irrationally trying to hold on to the old paradigm. Um, first, they're just doing that the way they always did, only harder. And then they're doing it in, I guess, in a sense, an even more irrational way that they're arguing with each other about how to do it and trying all kinds of weird ways of doing it. <laughs> and then the Gestalt switch is also not a free rational act. Right? Like I said, it's not that you realize that it's actually a rabbit. 
it's the right it's not like seeing something in the distance and thinking it's a duck but then getting closer and seeing oh it's really a rabbit it's that you suddenly see it as a rabbit who knows why <laughs> right so that phase isn't free and then what happens afterwards isn't free because people can't compare the new paradigm with the old one to see which one is better, really. They don't think the old way at all anymore. They can't, in a sense, can't understand it. Okay, that's all I have time for today, and I'll see you next week. Bye.